Sample fixation is very critical for all downstream histology. Biology is dynamic and it is spatially organized. What we want to see in our samples is that there is like a, a signature of the dynamic processes which were happening inside the living organism. And sometimes when we're lucky, we can find it as in the case of those erythrocytes that were traveling through the blood vessel here. Now, if we want to preserve that information about the spatial organization, the phenotype of the cells, um, if we want to kind of perhaps even see um, in our fixed tissue how cells were moving before they were fixed, we have to freeze the time in a certain way. And to do that, we use fixation. And this is really key factor in your success. Um, because a property fixation is central to all histology, without it, the analysis is perhaps not useless, but very, very difficult. There are two books that um, create a very nice introduction to the subject. They both state that well fixed tissues almost impervious to um, abuse during the processing and staining procedures. We subject tissues to quite harsh conditions, and if they're not fixed, they don't survive it well. Another rule of thumb that you may want to use is that if you put garbage in, you get garbage out and no histologist or histotechnologist can save your tissues if they are um, rotten by the time they um, get to the histology uh, professional. So ideal fixatives don't really exist, but is formula in any good? Ideally, those are the things that we want from a good fixative. It should be fast. Um, it should go through the sample almost immediately. The tissues and cells, their structures should be preserved. And uh, ideally, we would like to see that the fixative worked all the way down to the level that would allow us to do electron microscopy or super resolution imaging on those tissues. Immunogenicity should be preserved. That's very important for our subsequent studies with antibodies and it should not cause any new antigen determinants um, to be present in the tissue. We should also not create something in the tissue that wasn't there before, such as weird pigments or, or other things. Um, it would be great if the results were reproducible, that's for sure, and sample should be protected against all of the stuff that happens to the tissue when we process it. Ideally, and I'm pretty sure not only your EHNS will um, be happy um, if that was true, the fixative should be non-toxic and easy to dispose of. Unfortunately, that's not really, um, that's not really what formalin is. Um, formalin is a bread and butter of majority of the um, blogs that you will ever interact with your life um, but uh, it has been shown that proteins can actually move during the chemical fixation process that happens in the membranes that also happens in um, cell compartments such as nucleoli and um, as for the relationships or structures um, for example lipids in this sample are not preserved and they are washed away during the subsequent uh, tissue processing. Um, we, I think all who have tried to work with some older samples know that um, antigenicity is a problem in aged tissues and not only aged tissues, some antibodies just simply don't recognize the epitopes after the fixation. So my cat, who is a part philosopher, part cat, um, often looks me in the eye and says, are you saying, are you really using, using formalin for that? Well, because the results are mostly reproducible and because sample is protected against structural and functional modifications, um, we stick to formalin as the most commonly used fixative. So formaldehyde is really what is used in the fixation process and 
10% neutral buffered formalin. That's the most common preparation of um, formaldehyde that is used for fixation. That in turn contains 4% formaldehyde and is stabilized with methanol. I know, complicated, right? But formaldehyde is really a gas. It's a small molecule that rapidly dissolves in water, then it combines to form metal and hydrate. And generally speaking, fixation is a pretty complex process that results in modification and cross-linking of proteins. So the term paraformaldehyde um, comes from um, the history of how formaldehyde has been traditionally made in the labs. We used to take paraformaldehyde powder, often a granulate, and we would cook it at, at about 60 degrees in the presence of, of alkaline solution. And this polymer would break down into active formaldehyde. Now, because formaldehyde is the seventh most prevalent allergen, and because you can buy ready-made solutions of both paraformaldehyde and glutaraldehyde, there is really no need to um, cook your um, your power from all the height in the lab. You can just buy those ready-made solutions. In our practice, it turns out that both zinc formalin, which is a special preparation of formalin that has some added zinc ions, and 4% paraformaldehyde, um, which is a solution of um, formaldehyde in water, um, they, they, are, they are both fine um, for majority of the uh, fixation processes that we work with. We prefer zinc formalin over 10% NBF, but honestly, um, there is not much difference between them. What is important, though, is that your tissues should be small. They should be less than 3 millimeters, because that's about how much space you have in the histological cassette. You don't want to squeeze your samples. And you do need to trim your larger tissues if needed. Now, the very important factor is the ratio between the fixative and tissue. And that volume should be at least 20 to 1. You want to fix as soon as possible after the sample has been procured. And we recommend a minimum of 24 hour fixation up to 72 hours. Bones are slightly different. Um, it takes longer for the fixative to penetrate through them and you want to fix them for 72 hours and change your fixative each morning. We recommend um, fixation at room temperature. Putting it into the cold room or in the refrigerator will slow down this chemical process and you may not get um, your sample fix all the way. We highly recommend flat bottom containers. They provide better surface area for the sample to have in, to be in contact with formalin. Um, what we especially do not like is to see samples that are coming in the conical tubes. In those tubes, samples have a lot of contact with plastic, but not really too much with the fixative. And we recommend to fix on a rocker or with a steer bar in a larger jar. That rocker gently swishes the um, formalin inside and um, the layer of depleted solution that um, is created at a place where formalin is fixing your tissue can be replenished with that gentle rocking. Um, in our lab, we have clear fluid policy. So for example, we cannot accept samples that were fixed in Boeing's solution because that can leach to other samples in your batch and can potentially damage them. Um, very bloody samples require more formalin um, because it's being consumed more quickly. After fixation, you want to trim the tissues as uh, mentioned at the top and you want to move, you, move them to cassettes and then we like to immerse them in 70% isopropanol um, you then bring them to the place that will process the tissues in a secondary container. And um, samples are considered to be safe where they are kept in 70% isopropanol. We like to process those tissues as soon as possible. 
We like isopropyl over ethanol. We find that it's a little bit more gentle on the tissues. It's also usually a lot more economical. What is very important is that you label your cassettes with pencil or Statmark pen. Do not use Sharpies on your cassettes. They will, the Sharpie will not survive tissue processing. And you want to use a unique identifier for each sample and you want to record it in the database. And this is an example of, of a printed cassette that, um, that we generate in, in, in our lab. Tofu is very into histotechnology. Um, she's going to be taking her uh, HTL exam soon. So she's studying hard and she wants to tell you that in order to decide whether your tissue is properly fixed, um, you want to look at certain features inside your tissue, such as crisp nuclear details, contrast between the cytosol and the nucleus, and proper relation of cells. So there are two examples here of a mouse liver, and one of them is fixed in a, in a good way, and one of them looks pretty horrible. So the one on the left, um, there was inadequate fixation. The ratio between fixative and tissue was too low, and the tissue itself was too thick. When we zoom in, um, we can see that the distinction between the cytosol and the nucleus, all of this looks pretty bad. It's smushed, it's, you don't really see um, the membranes, um, the nuclear details are gone. The left one looks pretty horrible. This is an example from mouse lung. And now the tissue on the right um, was too thick, was also damaged while harvesting. Um, and again, we are uh, seeing an example of inadequate fixation. Um, the structures that are nicely seen on the left um, are very disturbed on the right, and you kind of cannot really see what's going on there. That's an example from mouse kidney, where tissue on the left has been harvested post-mortem, and that delayed fixation resulted in autolysis. Um, sometimes we are seeing that tissues do not want to stain with, with eosin, and that is probably because there was a massive loss of protein um, from the tissue of interest. Uh, this example is um, an example of, of a mouse uh, intestine. And on the segment on the left, you can see a very nice brush border right here. You can see the membranes in between the cells. There are interesting structures in the nuclei. Whereas tissue on the right, all of them are smooshed and essentially the delay in fixation here resulted in autolysis and um, also the epithelium separated from the lamina propria down there. There are many alternative tissue fixation approaches. In the past, people were using a lot of freezing you want to do it as quickly as possible to minimize ice crystal formation. You will use some kind of cryoprotectant such as um, OCT. And there are a couple of different ways how you can facilitate that quick freezing. One of the methods is to freeze in isopentane that is in the liquid nitrogen bath. The other one is liquid nitrogen vapor. There are heat extractors or solid CO2 pellets or blocks. All of those methods have their benefits. We find that using pre-chilled heat extractors gives us the best reproducibility across different labs and across different tissues. If you want to preserve fluorescent proteins, um, you can freeze them after fixation. Formaldehyde can be perfused through the animal. We prefer to use lower concentrations of formaldehyde. And then the tissue goes through a sucrose gradient to remove extra water from the tissue. And then we follow with the freezing in cryoprotectant. And on the right hand side, there is um, an image from uh, mouse gut uh, with C11, CYFP, and an F480 staining um, in the lamina propria. So histology is real art. And uh, there's lots of innovations that happened over the last 20, 30 years um, that allow you want to to do better job um, much of this is coming from the clinical world um, where histopathology is still um, one of the very important factors deciding on the course of treatment 
um, it is um, a skill that um, requires a lot of patience, a lot of practice. Um, there are people that are very talented and they can do those things that are shown on the screen. I'm not one of them, but I'm very happy that I can work with some of our very um, talented folks from the core. There is a lot of automation and if you have an ability to work with a group that has some of this automation, um, your overall quality of the samples will very likely be higher than when you're doing this manually. And um, because majority of those slides will be digitized, um, you have to think about the whole process. Um, every step um, needs to be improved in order to um, give you the best quality of the sample, but it all starts with the fixation. Because underfixed tissues don't process well. Um, so on the left, you can see one of my first blocks. I was very bad at this, um, but I managed to improve my process. Um, those tissues are so yellow because they're fixed in buoyants. Um, there were generations of positives that came after me and they perfected the method of uh, obtaining very high quality Swiss rolls without the use of buoyants. The problem with underfixed tissues is that they don't only process um, poorly, they don't cut well at all. And sometimes you cannot just get those tissues to stick to the slides. So for an art that is over 150 years old, because H&E has been around since 1877, um, the, the formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue um, has been used throughout the majority of that time. Um, you can store those archival blocks for years. There are many traditional histological stains that can be performed. Um, and that's essentially basis for almost all pathology. There are extensive data sets, so you can do deep learning on those. But um, archival FFP blocks um, can also be used for um, molecular diagnostics. You can use immunofluorescence to look at proteins. You can lose, use in situ hybridization to look at DNA and RNA. And spatial transcriptomics methods are rapidly advancing. In this tissue type that has been deemed inappropriate for a lot of things that are listed on this um, on this page. And good FFP samples can be can be used for um, applications such as super resolution microscopy. So here we're looking at um, mitochondria that are labeled with TOM20 um, from a, a piece of kidney that has been embedded in FFP. On the left hand side, you see um, confocal image. And on the right hand side, you, you see a 2D stat image of those uh, mitochondrial membranes. So when you start to formulate your biological question, you're going to go through a phase of experiment planning. Then you're going to prepare some samples and acquire some images. And then you're going to get into the stage where you're doing image analysis. And what's important to know is that this is not microscopy pit of despair, but there is this cycle. You, after getting some preliminary data from your image analysis, you will very likely want to go back to experiment planning, fix a thing, few things, improve your sample preparation, perfect your image acquisition, and then you will often realize that your image analysis can be done much more easily and um, you, will, you have eliminated some of the most egregious artifacts. That process starts with getting your tissues fixed properly. With a couple of rounds, you can get uh, high quality data that you will be happy to show and present to the world. Thank you.